Pledge complete. I finished all of Final Fantasy XIV up to the end of Heaven's Ward 3.55 before June 30th. Here are all my thoughts as I'm about to embark into Stormblood, the second expansion of FF14. Welcome back, Lassie Crew. This is the final journal for a little while in my Final Fantasy XIV journey. I pledged to make it to the end of Heaven's Ward. I've made it, I completed it before my deadline, and now I'm going to go play some Monster Hunter GU. I don't know when I'm going to come back to Stormblood, uh, to play Stormblood, but I wanted to share my thoughts on where everything is, because the last two patches, 3.4, 3.5, 3.55, that matter is all pretty much setting up for Stormblood which is giving me a very different feeling compared to when I was wrapping up Realm Reborn heading into Heaven's Ward and so I'm going to be comparing those a lot and also reflecting on what it's been like playing this MMO for almost 150 hours over the last few months how it lived up to my expectations and just where I'm at with the with the game as a whole because this game means a lot of things to different people and of course it means something to me now so last time I just finished with Endog and taking out his eyes, throwing it over the bridge. Actually, before we get into 3.4, what I first did was taking, uh, taking advantage of a yokai event that was happening, yokai watch. So I dabbled in that for an hour. I really like how this event is structured. First, you have to get the watch so that you could participate in duties. I think that's what they were called. Fates, not duties, fates. So that you could then collect medals to then get yokais. And if you collected enough yokais, you could get mounts. And then you could eventually strap strategically play in certain areas to try and unlock legendary weapons depending on what you wanted. I didn't care for the weapons, I also didn't have the time for it. What I did like is minion collecting and so the fact that I could collect I think it's up to 15 minions just by rotating around, that to me was quite fun. And I got about, I think, five or six yokai. So unfortunately, I didn't get enough to unlock the mount. I think you needed like 13 or so to get the mount. I was enjoying collecting it, but it has to be done like in different phases or either with a group of people. Cause I did it for about an hour and after collecting five or six, I'm like, okay, I'm satisfied. I'm, I'm over this game loop. Let's go do something else. And then from there, I actually went back to the uh, MSQ. Unfortunately, the event has ended now. So I can not go back and actually complete my minion gathering for the yokais. I'll have to wait probably another two, three years for that content to come back. But such as the things of MMOs, you're either you take advantage of the content as it comes. I don't really get much of a sense of FOMO when it comes to this game. While I'm playing it, I will participate in events. I will gather what I have, but I'm not about like, oh, I got to collect them all. I think that creates unnecessary stress in my play style. No shade if that's how you play it, but that's just how I am. I go with the flow, whatever is available while I'm playing. I'll take advantage of it. Other than that, we move on. Now we're back into the game. The dragon's dead. Estinian's back to his sane self, although now he has lost his sense of purpose because he doesn't know who to be angry at anymore. And so we kind of get this closure with Estinian. You've got uh, Alphino kind of like saying, you know, there's more to life than revenge. There's the power of friendship and I'm your friend and blah, blah, blah. I'm not sure if we're going to see Estinian again as a character. I think his story is done. I don't see how we could use him again unless they send him on a whole different story arc. I mean, he has a whole new identity to build for himself. So there is a lot of potential there. And as a warrior, I wouldn't be surprised if he comes back in Stormblood. And now I'm not going to go kind of like linearly into what I experience and what I'm thinking. I'm going to bounce around because this whole journal is to recap the end and the preparation of Stormblood. And so I know that the third expansion is very war heavy, just like this one was a little bit more fantasy from what I understand. Well, not from what I understand. I know Heaven's Ward is very fantasy. It's a story about dragons and humans and the war that ensued. Whereas the second expansion, Stormblood, seems to be focused a lot more on the proper war between the Empire and the Free Folk. I'm gonna call them the Free Folk because I could say the Eorzean Alliance, but it seems to include more than that. It seems to be everyone who's not Empire against the Empire, which if that is what the second expansion is, it's kind of a callback to 2.0 with a Realm Reborn where the main enemy was the Empire. It just makes that whole story bit look like a skirmish in comparison to what it sounds like is coming up with Stormblood. Meanwhile, we get a lot of wrap-up uh, story with the Ishgardians. So we've got Emmerich, who has now officially formed a republic that comprises a house of commons, a house of lords, separating state and church, which goes back to what I was saying in my last journal, that this game really echoes a lot of the things we see in our real world. I'm pretty sure this is based on English... Uh, 
government structure. And I say this very naively, like I'm just not that familiar with how, you know, people in the, how the UK government is formed. But I seem to recall that there is a House of Commons and a House of Lords. But I think that's what it is in the UK. And, you know, the whole state and church is all kind of the, the root of democracy in the Western world. So the fact that Ishgard is embracing this sets it up for a lot of exploratory narrative plots of, well, here's what we're seeing in our real world. Now let's explore this in this fantasy world. The next stage after this in the story, uh, Emmerich gets super smiley. And it's so weird because he's been such a broody, angry man for the whole time we've been with him. But now he's happy. His war's over. He's built his, like, he, his dad's dead. His oppressive dad's dead. He's kind of in the spotlight now. And what can this guy do? I mean, all he's got to do is play politics and drink. And so he's all like, oh, oh my buddy, come and drink with me. He is so flirty towards me. He just wants to take me out. And it really is a 180 switch on this character who is so broody and now he's like my best chum who was just wants to like hang out with me and his in his intentions are questionable because it's almost like over the top friendliness it's like a little questionable about the friendliness but i like it i like sir Emmerich's attention so that wraps up that thread and then we start getting the new plot threads given to us so we go back to the warriors of darkness alice say is now back in the story so she runs away from them uh gets hit by an arrow and poison. Luckily, Thancred was there to save her. And now we start getting a little bit more into the focus of who are these warriors of darkness? What do they want? I, I preemptively already shared this in the last journal by accident because my streams were kind of overlapping. My journals weren't up to date with my streams. Anyway, sorry about that. We know now that the warriors of darkness, what they're here for, they're basically here to try to bring on, um, they're trying to save their world because it's covered in light and they're kind of doing it in a weird, strange way. So we're pretty much interrupting them first from trying to kill Garuda, then they try to kill Titan, which has a whole little side story with this poor little boy. I don't know if he's a boy or what to call him, but this poor little thing called Gabu, who this made me feel so much because it's so sad. So Gabu is trying to get back to his parents who apparently have been kidnapped as, as sacrifices to bring back Titan. And so we go with Gabu to save him or to save his parents only to find out that we're too late and Gabu sees his parents dead there who have already been sacrificed for the sake of bringing back Titan. And in his anguish, he summons Titan, which is just the most tragic like bit that could have happened to this poor little creature. And he's got the cutest name. So I really felt bad for Gabu. Now Titan came up, we beat him back down. Then we start getting um, plot threads for the next narrative piece, which all revolves around Little Al Amigo. So Uri Angé mentions that, oh, there's not, there's crystals being funneled there. Like there's a lot of um, suggestions that primals are coming back. This is like the whole overall theme of FF14 is gotta go stop people from summoning primals or gotta go kill primals before the warriors of darkness do it. So this is where it gets kind of interesting and I'm kind of jumping around what happened first, but I'm gonna kind of go with, we got closure to the warrior of darkness ban uh, a story to some degree which i was not expecting i was really thinking that the warriors of darkness group would be the next antagonist to the next expansion and even beyond that i thought that the third expansion i think it's called Shadowbringers. i think that's the third one i thought Shadowbringers would be linked to the warriors of darkness of this group for some reason i don't know why i can't explain it so to see that they've gotten closure and i and this all happened because uri Ange, who is also What's his name? He also shows up as another character. So we basically find out through the whole thing, Uri Ange was not actually a traitor, which makes me go like, well, I still don't really like him, but I guess I can't hate him now because he's back on the good side. He was orchestrating this whole thing for the Warriors of Darkness and the Warrior of Light to face off so that they could all kind of like shimmer their crystals together, which is really weird that Uri Ange knew how to do all this. But anyways, we fight them in what is one of the most iconic fights where my group takes on the warriors of darkness as we're beating them they keep reviving it's kind of an endless pointless fight and then alice comes out with the coolest sword of energy and she's like i got this and we just gotta like defend her and the mechanics of the fight becomes very interesting and then when we finally slay them that's when you is like everybody haha we're all like in this together raise your crystals and that takes us to the Heidelin realm uh to which point the, they're all like sharing their story that it's a real story of you know, their world is messed up because there's too much light. They did all the good things. They fought for the light and they got rewarded by the whole world basically being destroyed by the light. Now, it seems like because all their crystals were, were I don't know, attuned or something, that gave Hydaelyn more strength, which let her free Minphilia so that she can go back with the Warriors of Darkness to their world 
to absorb the light back into Hydaelyn. This is how I'm understanding it. I don't know if it's right. To save their world, which is nice, happy closure because they got what they wanted. But is that how easy it is? Like, how do you just absorb light? Don't you have to introduce darkness? I don't know. I say it's closure, but that plot thread is definitely going to come back some way, somehow. There's no way that... Anyways, so this is also where we get Minfilia's official goodbye. She gets to see all of the other Scions. Gives um, gives us Tupsimari, which is the the head of the staff for um, Louis Suez. So it's like the proper handoff of Minfilia. And I assume this is, for the most part, the end of Minfilia. We get the closure of, you know, Minfilia is not coming back. All the Scions got to see her. So that closes the chapter on that. So now we've closed the book the chapter on Ishgard. We've closed the book on the Warriors of Darkness. And now we're opening the book on really the only plot thread that we have left, which is what is going on in the Little All Amigo and where the heck is Papalimo and Ida and what are they doing? All of this, by the way, felt very weak to me. Uh, in, in hindsight, like it all makes sense. I see why they did it. But when I was remembering what it was like to wrap up Realm Reborn, and all of the things that they were setting up, like that ended in a crescendo with the bloody banquet. Here, I feel the crescendo has already happened, the end of the Dragon Song War. And now we're just like setting uh, setting something up, but nothing is like, what's happening? What's happening? That's what I feel at this point. And I said at this point because I actually got so pulled in, I ended up doing a six hour stream because I wanted to know what happened next. And I ended up completing my pledge like a week early just because I didn't want to stop playing. So I guess they know what they're doing. So anyways, we go back to Little Al Amigo. We learn that there's this whole group. Uh, I think they're called the Masks. There through our investigation, we find Papalimo and Ida. And we're like, yo, where were you guys? And like, oh, we were here. We tried to send letters. You didn't get them. And we're like, no, we thought you were dead. So that also wraps up the plot thread of the bl Bloody Banquet. Uh, we learn that the masks are led by the griffin and that they're basically trying to get their home back, Alamigo, because the Eorzean Alliance doesn't want to do anything about it. They lost their home like 20 years ago to the Garlean Empire and they want their home back and nobody else is going to fight for it. They will. Seems like it makes a lot of sense. Of course, all this is nice and kosher until we find out that the Asians are involved. And lo and behold, he gives the griffin the eyes that, of course, I was like, those are going to come back very soon. I was surprised to see them come back this quick. But anyways, the eyes of Endog are back in game. Now they're in the hands of the griffin. And everybody is suspecting that the griffin is trying to orchestrate a war between Eorzea and the Garlean Empire. Pretty smart for him because he knows he can't win against the Garlean Empire. So let's make the big powers fight so he can get his land back. Like I get this guy. So from here, um, this is where we get some buildup. I like the scene where we actually get Sir Emmerich joining in uh, Grudania and he's basically like joining the Alliance and everyone's trying to figure out like what's going on. We get a little tease of Nero coming back into the story. So he's like out in Cartno, like, aha, I found him. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. What are you up to Nero? I like this. I like this character. Nero's a, a good one. And so, um, yeah, then, uh, the Eorzean Alliance is, is on to what's going on with the Griffin. They're like, we should probably send some scouts and near the wall with the Garlean Empire near Little Alamigo. Little Alamigo? No, just Alamigo. That's where chaos begins. So we get this explosion. We get the dungeon uh, that we have to go now fight because there is basically a war that has started. The Griffin's plan is already in action. He has dressed up a bunch of his people in Eorzean Alliance gear, making it look like it's the Eorzean Alliance attacking the Empire. At least that's how I, what I think is happening. And at the end of this, we interrupt the Griffin. We fight him. We find out that he's actually Ilbert. What a surprise. Like, come on. We all saw that coming. And we get one of the most quotable lines of FF14. It's actually a soundbite on my channel now. As you're fighting him, he calls you sloppy, which is one of the best soundbites I've heard. I love it. Like every time I like mess up, even in Monster Hunter now, I'm just thinking, oh, sloppy, sloppy. So that fight ends. It seems like everything's going to go well until lo and behold, he decides to sacrifice himself with the eyes, summoning one of the like craziest primals ever that we don't know what it is at this point. But we're like, holy heck, this is going to be powerful. So Papalimo pulls out the Tupsimari and seals it very much like Louis Sua, therefore sacrificing himself. And I say sacrificing like this because... I don't feel like he's dead. Everything points to him being dead. The The story is not apologetic about being like Papa Limo is dead, yo. Like he did the same thing Louis Sua did uh, and that killed Louis Sua. And you even see like this mark on Ida disappear, which was apparently cast by Papa Limo. 
everything is telling me he's dead, but I don't feel like he's dead. I'm like, ah, uh, something's off here. It felt too easy. Like he, he sacrificed himself. Like, I don't know. I felt that there wasn't enough of, the, of an emotional buildup to kill this character. And so I don't believe he's dead. And I might just be in denial, but I, I can't feel sad about Papa Limo right now because I'm sure he's somewhere. But no, the game hasn't told me any of that yet. Like I progressed hours and there's still no sign of Papalimo. So maybe he's dead. I'm just still trying to deal with it. So with Papalimo's sacrifice, we get this new primal, which is sealed, but not dead. He's just sealed in a ball of light. And so now we got to figure out, great, what are we going to do with this ball of light? Q, awesome introduction to a new samurai. So the samurai arrives to the shores of Eorzea, which is getting set up for Stormblood, where the samurais are introduced. We learn this is Gotetsu. What an intro. Love this character already. He's loud, he's boisterous, he's a little bit dumb. And then everyone's trying to figure out. So now flashback to Gridania. The leadership's trying to figure out what do we do with this big ball of light primal? Like, how do we get rid of this? Nero shows up. He's like, yo, everybody, I hear you need some help. I'm like, oh, what a cool intro. We're just bringing all the characters. I'm starting to now develop attachment to the characters at this point. They're using their characters in a way that feels a little bit less stiff, I find. And so now we got Nero, we got Gotetsu, and then like Yugiri's like, yo, you're from my land. And so we're getting more like diversity just in the world of, um, of what's going on around here. So all of this sets the land where Nero's like, hey, I've got Omega. You guys remember that thing? We can use Omega to destroy that. Just like how the old Alligans took care of Bahamut. And everyone's like, that sounds like a pretty crazy idea. It's like, oh, you got any, any other option? And so off we go to the Cartno Flats. We summon Omega, which I was expecting to be like this massive robot. Turns out it's like a little beetle uh, robot, which moves fast. Very different than what I was expecting. And Q, one of the most epic cutscenes we've gotten yet in game, which is the battle between Omega and and what I've later learned is the primal Shinryu, which this thing is just, it looks like a cross between a, a Leviathan and a Bahamut. It's, it looks pretty crazy. Cool fight. And then after all of that settles, we get into our first major plot twist where Ida reveals herself for her true nature, which is, oh, I am actually Lise, Ida's younger sister. And even though we were talking with this character the whole time, and we actually have no concept of who Ida was, when she told me Ida died five years ago, I'm just like, oh no, Ida. Even though I don't know who she is, I'm like, but Ida, she's dead. And so now we have Lise, who is quite bluntly quite hot because especially the way that they dress her up in uh, her Stormblood debut. So now at this point, Yugiri and Gotetsu are like, well, we're going to go back to Doma and everything is set for like, well, the war is about to break up here in Eorzea. We're screwed. And at this point, I pretty much just queued up the Stormblood trailer to look at it. And I really feel the Stormblood trailer had a lot less info than the Heaven's Ward trailer. I feel Heaven's Ward trailer had more of a narrative punch to it. It had more emotions. It was showing you the the like the wrap up of the bloody banquet where I'm feeling like angry vengeance about that. There's they're laying up the next story arc of the dragons and Ishgard, and there's just so much emotion in uh, that trailer. In comparison, Stormblood, like in my notes, it's all about introducing things. So you get introduced first to the monks, you see Lise and uh, the, the Warrior of Light fighting on this like hand, which is introducing kind of like, I guess the monk world, even though the monks are already in the game. It, it just shows off Lise in a really like hot outfit. And then it just shows like, okay, now we're going across the sea to these other lands. And we see like an under, underwater temple. All, everything is very um, kind of like East cul Eastern culture inspired. We hear a lot of like, for lack of a better word, like Asian instruments, Asian temples. I know I'm being very broad here. Uh, we get introduced to the samurai town and then we see like a samurai fighting samurai-esque soldiers, I guess. And at this point we see uh, Gogetsu and Yugiri like standing atop the town looking on. And I have to say, I've thrown a lot of shade to Yugiri, but I think they gave her new drip in the trailer. She looks fantastic here. This is like the best Yugiri has ever been. She can keep the mask off in her CGI form. And that's it. It's all like, hey, look, let's nerd out to like Eastern culture stuff is how I see it as a Western dude. Uh, but it doesn't really convey much. Like I'm surprised the trailer didn't show um, much of anything from a, the primal that we just summoned. It doesn't show anything from the empire. It just really shows like, hey, adventurer, here's where we're going to explore next. And then the music and the, the final music is very like military based. So it is drumming up that sense of war. And even the banner at the end is like evoking a sense of war. And then it's like Stormblood, of course. It's a, there's a storm coming made of like through war, which is blood. So now the expansion makes sense. 
So I'm surprised that how do you go from, you know, the two point, uh, 3.0 trailer, which is so powerful, to the 4.0 trailer, which is okay, but it's a step down for sure. And I've heard a lot of people say that 4.0 is one of the weakest expansions. And the fact that I'm already feeling a little underwhelmed going into it does not make me feel too confident about what I'm going to think of 4.0. But then I hear 5.0 and 6.0 is where it soars. And I think we're in 7.0 with Dawn Trail now, so I'll, I don't know. So that's where I'm at. Um, upon reflecting, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep this relatively short. You know, I went into FF14 with the expectation of it being the best story ever told in, ever, in any medium. And I've shared this kind of along the way, so it shouldn't be a surprise. But I, I just disagree with that claim at this time. I feel that the MMO formula does hold this story back from being told. Um, I do think that when you consume the story the way I am, which is you focus on the main story, you don't get the chance to be ingrained into the world to the same level as those who originally experienced it 10 years ago when they were waiting for the content to come out. And that gave them more time to kind of absorb the rest of the world, do other things, connect with this fantasy world more so that when new story was dropped, it, it was more rewarding. It was like better. But when you're consuming it all back to back to back, it just feels a little, I don't want to say shallow because it's not sh that shallow. There's a lot of threads and there's a lot of depth to the story, but it's, I think stiff is the right word, you know, and it comes back to MMO, just the animation being so limited, your main character not being able to talk, the overabundance of like nodding, so many cutscenes of watching people standing and nodding. Like there's so much of that, which that gives the sense of stiffness. And the, even the combat where I'm at now, and I know that people would say, well, you're only playing one class, switch it. But I feel, you know, I'm pretty much on autopilot at this point. It's like, get the story, do my combos for my samurai so I can like melt things. There are some fights which are more fun and strategic than others, but a lot of it is just repeat the combo, repeat the combo. And then where it gets a little bit more strategic is like, okay, coordinate with your team. So is this a mind blowing game to me at this stage uh, 10 years after it came out? No, it's not. It's something I'm glad I experienced. I'm glad I understand the reference, the characters, this world. I want to keep exploring it. I want to keep seeing where this goes. But if I would be introducing anybody to this game, I would be throwing their expectations so low, even after Heaven's Ward, I would be saying, you know, this is a game that has a lot of impact to pop culture reference. It is a game that is beloved by many. It has a story that is definitely worth being experienced. Maybe watch a trailer on YouTube if you're not looking to grind 100 hours or invest 100 hours of your time or if you're not into MMOs. Um, otherwise, you know, it's, it's very hard to recommend to someone, especially if they're not into MMOs, especially if they don't have a lot of time. But all that said, I'm happy I did it. I'm going to keep doing it eventually. I don't know when. And for everyone else, um, I'm really glad that we I could share this with all of you and make it a little bit of a special experience for me. And I hope that you appreciated my first impressions of things, even if maybe I was sometimes not always kind to this game. So that's where we are. I really look forward to getting into the samurai world, but uh, I'm not going to get too excited since that could be many months away, if not like a year away. But when I do come back, I will be dropping messages everywhere and letting you know when I'll be returning to Eorzea or Doma. And until next time, keep it classy.